Okay, welcome to the fourth video of game development project. And on this a bit longer presentation, this uh, fourth lecture video, we are talking about things like uh, what differentiates game industry from the software industry. Also, what are the similarities between those two? So, how can you utilize your current or existing experience as a software developer in the games uh, development and games industry context? And, like always, uh, keep in mind that these videos are for the entire academic year. So, all the instructions here are the same for the entire year. And, uh, if you are looking at this video after this uh, academic year of 22-23 has ended, because the teacher or lecturer is trying to be smart and uh, has actually recorded all these videos uh, or intros during the same day, just switching the shirt between the takes, uh, there might be some differences between how the course is run and how this video explains things. So always only uh, do what the Moodle pages say. Follow those deadlines. If there are errata or instructions, follow those instructions and uh, don't listen to this video because this might have been changed after the video was released. So, like said, today's agenda is games from the viewpoint of software engineering. So, what is the common ground between software development and game development, software testing, game testing, or software design and game design. Also, in a larger scale, what are the similarities and differences between software developing organizations and game studios? Uh, in overall uh, course agenda, the idea is for you to understand uh, how you can use your software engineering or software development experience to be able to function and work as a game developer or at least participate to a game development uh, project as a part of the uh, as a part or member of a larger team but you know uh, if we start with the software development so there's a sort of list of things that are related to software development work, especially if you are running a startup company. So you do have some development process and you are doing development phases. It doesn't matter if you are doing continuous deployment or continuous integration, scrum, waterfall, whatever, you still have a development process and phases you need to do. Design work, development work, testing work, and then maintenance work. It's just something you need to do if you are in the software business. Similarly, you have tools and techniques. You have a certain programming language. You have certain programming environment, development engine, the tools to do test automation. Whatever you need to do, you have tools and techniques. Also, you probably have a way of testing your software. You need to ensure that everything is in place, everything works, Everything fulfills the criteria on which your customers or your users or someone who is paying you for the development of software actually grade or deem that your work is done or that everything is good enough. So that's test process and there's activities you need to do to actually achieve a certain level of quality. Uh, on the quality itself, because you have a certain objective you also need to somehow measure your quality. It, usually in smaller organizations, the quality is that, well, it works, now it's good. On the larger organizations or larger services or whatever you are doing, you more or less have some way of measuring quality. Not perhaps the absolute quality, but relative quality, in a sense that you know if your last batch or last upgrade or last addition was a success or faulty, because if it's a faulty one, then you roll back and continue from the last position. Or you do something else like A-B testing with the user to establish which one is the better way 
of doing things. For example, Amazon likes to do this. That's why you sometimes see a Amazon web shop and it has some completely weird widgets you have been selected to be user of. And if, the, if it's not good enough, if it's not liked enough, or if the users don't find it useful, then it's gone. Because no one liked it, because it didn't fulfill the quality requirements. There's also actually a full set of measurements to establish what the software quality could be or how it could be measured, but that's somewhat beyond the scope of this course. Just know that there is a standard for how to define quality in software, similarly as how to define or how to follow certain development or test process steps. If you need to do something or define something for larger customer or organization which is buying your outsourced work, then you might want to follow some or say that you follow some guideline, whether it's a certification or something like that. There's also a certain aspect of creativity involved, especially if you are doing mobile applications. You need something uh, so that your product or service is something that differentiates from your competition. Or, or it's something novel, something completely new that makes money. No one needs fifth calendar software on their mobile phone. But for example, several uh, small uh, mobile apps like ordering food from restaurant, which doesn't normally deliver to home addresses. Working as a middleman there actually has been a fairly successful thing lately. Or the taxi cab software or, well, driver for hire software more or less. These, have, these are something that's creative. They create something new from the existing resources or tap into something that people are actually willing to pay for. Similarly, you have assets. You need to have at least something uh, whether it's knowledge capital. I mean, you need programmers, you need people who understand back end or front end, or people who understand the technology you are working with, so that you can even have anything in your organization. And especially if you are a startup company, you need funding, you need to decide what's your first entry product, what are your key assets, what are your starting assets. For example, if there's a regional development or regional uh, startup factory or something like that, they might be able to provide you with certain help to start your business. But nevertheless, you need funding to stay afloat because otherwise you are just having a very, very expensive hobby, which doesn't make you any money. Finally, you have human resources. So you have people who have experience, knowledge, and who have certain level of training, education, certificates, whatever. On some industrial domains, you need to have certain certificates for the people who are doing quality assurance work on your product. Or you need to have certain certification so that you, your software can be never installed into a power plant or whatever uh, framework or platform. But nevertheless, even if you are just doing something funny, then you still have uh, human resources or human knowledge and your organization requires expertise so that you can actually do programming work. So this is a software organization. And of course, uh, considering that there's several different things here, how do we do software? How, uh, on what tools we do software? How do we do quality assurance? How do we design our things? How do we run our business and what sort of people we have is actually exactly the same with the game studios. So only thing differentiating software industry and games industry on these aspects is that I added one word to the center balloon here. So basically, if you go to a game startup or creative startup or creative software engineering startup, I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily games. It's just a playful design for something boring and normal, like making a game out of filling your income tax, like, which is an example I keep using all the time because it doesn't exist yet. But still, all these things actually are the same. So now that you are studying for software engineering degree, 
if you want to pursue a uh, career in something like the developer or systems architect or technical expert or something to this degree, then you can also look into the games industry. It's basically the same thing or trying to find funding for your products. It's more or less the same thing. And that this is also why we have this course. Because even though we are engineers, we probably are not something that someone considers a hugely creative game designer. We are still learning things which are more or less preparing you to work also as a software developer. So today we are looking into the things uh, in a bit more detail on what uh, makes these, uh, what similarities and differences there actually are, because most of the things are fairly same, especially if you are doing a startup making a phone app service or making a startup making phone game. That they are almost exactly the same sort of organizations. So, how do we make games or why do we make games, more or less? Well, first of all, uh, being a realistic says that you make games because you can make money out of it. This is a bit older uh, chart, but uh, it still gives you a fairly good idea on what's going on with the industry. So these are creative industries mentioned here. The green one, green one is games, blue one is movies, and the yellow one is music. Already in 2013, it was apparent that the music industry is a dwarf. It's a really, really small area of entertainment, uh, especially considering games, which have been growing constantly for several years now. Actually, uh, games and movies are right now at the same level apart here, 130 billion US dollars yearly. So games and movies are more or less the same uh, size of an industry. And the music industry is something that's fairly small. This is also something that surprises some of the people because everyone is looking for the new Rolling Stones or what Beatles or something like that. So why isn't Finnish music industry making huge rock stars anymore like it used to do a couple ten years ago? At the, at, at the same time, people sideline the games industry because it's something that makes money every now and then when we should be actually considering that the games industry is overtaking movies already you know, worldwide. If you consider the software industry in this context, in 2007, the software industry uh, did uh, $300 billion. So in this scale, it would mean that it's on the upper floor there somewhere. And not only that, that's only the software industry. Industries which make and create software and software-based services. Nothing embedded like automotive or aviation or anything, any of these industries, because the software or the software-based service isn't the thing they are doing. The software industry here is uh, someone like Microsoft or Google or stuff like that. And the combining all the industries which include software nowadays would probably be the entire economic uh, world of, of the entire globe, because all industries more or less need software to, to do something. But anyway, I'm uh, drifting a bit here. So considering that the software industry on 2007, about 10 years ago, was 300 billion, and the games industry was already then 40 billion US dollars annually on global sales, it also means that the games industry isn't something that really should be ignored if we are considering the entire area of software engineering or other way around, where do the programming talent or where the programming talent is needed in a global industrial scale. So, these are also old information. These numbers haven't really changed that much uh, during the uh, last 10 or so years. So, uh, three out of four households play games. Uh, average age of the players or people using money on games industry products is 37 years. It's 
closer to the mid age than high school because there's several different areas of, soft, of uh, and software or games industry and entertainment products, meaning that basically everyone play pays for something sometime or everyone plays something at some time. 42% of the people who buy games or spend money or time with them are female and every third gamer or people who use game products lists games or video games or digital entertainment as their favorite hobby. So of course that's also something they are willing to spend money on because that's the one thing they like to do most when they have free time to do something. The number of the uh, average age, average, average age, and the number of female uh, in the uh, demographics usually is no longer a full surprise to anyone because, of course, uh, people play. Of course, the video games are no longer something that 40 year, year old uh, boys do in the basement with the second TV setup like it used to be in the 80s or 90s. And in fact, the new generation of people who actually have been born in the era of smartphones don't find it anything uh, weird or uh, there's nothing nerdy about playing games because they have been always and it's a form of entertainment like everything else. So, if we look into the software development and uh, games development, uh, there's several common features or themes. Of course, like I mentioned on the first slide, we always need to do design work. We need to have some sort of form of design, whether it's a prototype or anything else, to understand what we should be doing, what's something that interests our customers or what could uh, lure the customers to come to our organization. We also need to do development work and we have programming tasks. There's no crazy way of doing programming work. We need to develop something, we need to do programming. There's no escape on that. Even with the game engines or anything else, they still are just platforms on top of which we do programming work to create our masterpiece. We have development tools. In fact, if we are doing something a bit crazier or different or novel, we might actually be using the exactly the same tools as any software developer. Because the game engines themselves can't handle stuff that doesn't exist yet. So of course we need to do development with the Visual Studio or even C++ or something to that degree, because we need to optimize things. We need to be able to do something that's completely new, or we need to find a way to get more computing power out of this thing, because even though this has more computing power than all the space, space missions combined on the early days, it still has some it still has some limitations. So if we get more optimized code, we get more cool features. It's simply a uh, game of getting the best and most uh, getting the best performance out of the platform so that your games sell better or seem better or uh, give the impression of better quality or you can cram more stuff into one game. Of course this is a something that's a bit disappearing now especially if the 5G networks starts to work flawlessly there's basically no idea on where your game is actually happening but you are playing it on your mobile phone but keep in mind that this is something that has been promised us for the last 15 years so of course I'm becoming a bit old but I'm also a bit skeptical about how fluently or seamlessly it actually works but nevertheless you do programming work you have tools you need to do the two testing work how do you test stuff you do unit tests, you automate stuff, you test with the user, you test the user, the uh, user interface, the experience, all these normal things which you also do if you are designing a web store or something like that. Because that's what you simply need to do. If you have a crappy product, if your users don't like to use the product, or if you simply don't have the necessary features or your 
system crashes all the time or your orders or deliveries or something don't end up being uh, delivered or it loses payments or whatever the reason you still need to uh, do testing work and in general the software unlike games and games like software need to be done in time in budget with the intended features and acceptable quality there's no escape on that there's some leeway on how do you define the acceptable quality but still you need to have a time or schedule or budget or features we you intend to release and you need to have acceptable quality there's no escape of that on that because if you release a crappy product then you're never no one is going to buy your next product unless you are something someone like blizzard or activision or some huge company which could probably sell you a empty box from a prisma store well, and they and you still look for the next product well or activation code that doesn't do anything there's actually a bit of a misnomer here because usually if you buy a boxed game from uh, some hypermarket like prisma you only get a plastic box with a download code from steam or something like that anyway so that analog really doesn't work anymore but still you get the idea so of course it would be foolish to say that there's no differences of course there are first of all uh, the software developers have their audience the software application usually has its purpose for existing for example if you use an app which you can use to order food then you expect that you will get food at some point and pay money for it if you are using some uh, software which you can use to uh, hire a driver and car you press that i need a car and you expect someone to come to pick you up and take you to the place you are going if you are paying taxes online you expect that you will be able to pay those taxes or if you are ordering something or doing whatever chatting with people you expect that you will be actually a be able to contact people and the people get your message when you send them however with games what do you do with games you use them or play them to entertain yourself you uh, entertain yourself and you expect some sort of user experience if you play a scary game then you expect that you have some sort of scary experience if you are playing gran turismo or some driving game you expect that it's close enough simulation so that you find it interesting or whatever to that degree so you need to have more emphasis on the market situation is this something that's novel enough or does this have a uh, good market and you need to have more emphasis on the customers will there be enough people paying for this product or using the free to play feature and sometimes buying something and overall is there a target audience which finds this very interesting does this product have a possibility to become viral success of course viral success is uh, well uh, it's really difficult to uh, define how it happens but there are some and there are some organizations which try to enforce that to happen it usually also also always fails but still if you don't have enough customers you will never have a huge success so of course you need to have emphasis on thinking what are my customers what's the market i'm entering what's my competition doing what's the new crazy theme or something or something that people find interesting going on a market with a zombie game today would be a, a well economic suicide perhaps because zombies are like five or six almost 10 year old thing now so people are getting really bored with all that crap and looking for something else also well uh, when we are having emphasis on customers well, our design needs to also have artistic vision on how things will happen or what the game should look like feel like sound like what the user experience should be of course if you are doing a web store you don't really need to consider that part that much but if you are making something like games you need to have artistic vision and of course it would be a good thing if you have an artist to do that engineers can draw shit. I, i'm sorry they just can't so you need to have artists 
or someone who's talented on making that uh, theme or vision or something to actually happen and be presentable enough so that it actually attracts people. Uh, there's a inherent thinking in engineering that assault rifle is very good design because it works almost always. But if we are not actually looking just an assault rifle with games. We uh, 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 we are making an assault rifle that also looks nice. It has to look good. It has to sound good. It has to have a good user interface, and it also has to function. It has to have the technical quality and artistic quality at the same time. This also uh, includes the sound design work. And also, if you are doing some sort of a user experience, and then you should probably be doing testing with users. You should have representatives of your target audiences and see what they like. And if they come up with the uh, results or feedback saying that I don't, I hate this, I don't like this, I don't find this, find this interesting, then you have to be prepared to throw out everything and redesign everything because no one benefits from a bad game. If you release one, then you might as well just close down your studio because, well, your studio makes bad games. It's also about, about popularity contest because no one actually needs to use your software to achieve something. Finally, there's also some areas of development like client-to-client -client multiplayer, artificial intelligence, and 3D mathematics, which are a bit unusual. Of course, artificial intelligence is now a thing. Everyone wants artificial intelligence on everything. They, they used to want blockchains, but now everyone wants artificial intelligence. And that's also something that's currently being explored as a venue of making more smart tools or self-driving cars or whatever drones which can deliver stuff. But still, uh, artificial intelligence programmer isn't really that common thing. Or 3D mathematics, or making animations, or client-to-client -client multiplayer systems. Especially if we are considering game consoles which have fairly relative, uh, relatively a limited amount of resources or certain ways of doing things. And finally, uh, unlike software development, one objective needs to be added. Is the game fun? Or does the game provide the user experience we want to provide to our users? Of course, there's always some fringe areas of people who find the product attractive or might find the product attractive. For example, a animation series like something like My Little Pony, which for some fairly obscure reason, 20-year-old males find it very engaging and uh, have formed a huge fan community around it. I'm fairly certain that the people who made the original reboot didn't expect this to be the market audience, but it just happened. Of course, we shouldn't expect that to happen with our products. But is the game or product we are making providing you with an user experience we'd like to uh, give to our customers? Like I mentioned, if you have, I'm playing a Silent Hill game, it shouldn't make me laugh. It should be really uncomfortable experience, especially if I'm playing with it with a surround system during night time. Because that's something I'm paying for the game to scare me shitless. So, there's also some issues which reflect on how the games are developed when compared against something like how software is developed. For example, this here is a project management and software implementation process model for very small organizations. The ISO IEC 29110 here more or less defines what game, uh, uh, sorry, software developers should do as a minimum set of things when they are developing something. Very small organization, less than 10 people, if they want to systematically develop something and show that they are doing things. So they have project management, they plan, they do some plan execution, they do assessment and control, they do project closure, they start the implementation, they do requirements analysis, they 
identify the components that need to exist. They build stuff, they test stuff, and they deliver stuff. Very straightforward. And this is something that's generally agreed to work with the software industry. But of course, can this work with games? No, it can't. This is actually something that we were uh, doing a research on with the Finnish Software Measurement Association. It simply doesn't work. If you are making games, you can't make a strict design before you implement and test and prototype stuff. So at least the minimum amount of things you need to have is a planning phase, the pre-production, the implementation phase, the production, and delivery phase, the post-production. And during the uh, implementation, you need to have iteration because you never commit to one design and then just forget the stuff. That's not how game development works. You need, and you need something initial to have a target towards which you start to work, and then you make some, you test some, you make some, you test some, you revi refine and revise your designs based on the customer feedback and so on and so on. This is actually uh, how the organizations work. I've been showing this slide on several places, so I'm not going to go through this in detail again. But basically, the, these are the basic models which the companies tend to follow if they are game studios. They have a pipeline model where they follow a, an early brainstorming and prototype approach. If they are able to sell that prototype to someone internally or externally who will fund the production, then they do iterative design and testing and development work, and when they get publisher approval, they put it online and start the maintenance cycle in which they add more things or try to attract more customers or use marketing to buy in more people and get the free-to-play process or free-to-play cycle to roll. If they are a smaller organization or if they don't have cost, uh, customer or publisher, internal or external, uh, they do the iteration cycle. They have an idea and they start to roughly plan and design and you work towards getting something together so that it's publishable. It's a fairly more obscure method of doing a rough plan, development work, refining your design for the rest of the game to see what works, what can be done, testing stuff, getting feedback from anywhere, whether it's possible funders or possible publishers or test users or whatever. And when you run out of money or time, then you decide that, okay, now we will put this online and try to achieve uh, something with the game. If not anything else, then at least get publicity, get a portfolio uh, running so that we have games we can show to publishers or larger game studios and, buy and get a contract or subcontracted to do development work for them or develop games for them or be products like mobile version of their franchise games or stuff like that. No one wants to work with a game studio that hasn't published anything because they can't do games. If you have a couple of games in your portfolio, then they, you might actually get contracted work. And this is actually one way of keeping your business afloat. But anyway, on both these models, the idea or the it, uh, on what to publish, it actually uh, comes from the position of funding. If you have a publisher, if it's internal publisher, it means that you have several teams and your company uh, management or owners or whoever decides what's the idea we will do next. You will test the thing with the prototype. If it doesn't work or if it's not fun or if it's not engaging, then you throw the prototype away and design something else. If you are a small studio, then you just try a couple of ideas and stick with the best one. Try to get it published so that you will at some day be able to go towards having several ideas from which you can choose a thing. Also, if you find a niche, it's probably a good thing to make the product anyway, because it gives you uh, publicity, if nothing else. So, of course, 
this means that we all, you also need to focus on a bit different things in software development than uh, in game development than in software development. For example, uh, the user experience, like I said, is the key. Uh, we always test the technical aspects, like it loads, if the saves work, the, load, uh, the new games work, the uh, settings work, all the animations run correctly. There's no uh, out of sync with the input or what happens in games or the sound effects. Everything works. It's technically correct. But we focus on the uh, content. What's the user experience? And also, for example, that there's no always win strategies. If we have a long game, it gets boring if there's one way of always winning. There's actually also a part of it is with the multiplayer things. So we all know, if we, especially if you have been playing multiplayer games, that you have to sometimes nerf stuff. So because it's a game breaking program feature. So these things shouldn't exist in an optimal game. Of course they shouldn't, but they still do. But you, all, but you also have to test against these internal logic problems. This is something that's completely novel to the games industry. And in fact, actually, what we found when we were conducting studies between game startups and software startups is that uh, game startups actually have more dedicated resources on testing work than software companies. Uh, uh, game companies have almost 80% of the self-defined optimum of resources. And they spend much more time on doing testing work than software companies in general. In that sense, uh, testing-wise, game products tend to be much more refined at the first launch when the minimum viable product exists. On software, you can sometimes accept problems with the first launch, but with games, you make the first impression and that's something that you are using to sell your product. With the software that has other inherent uses, you always can find more people who might be uh, using your service or might find your software useful. But with games, you actually have to uh, pay very much attention on the first impression. Okay, so of course this reflects to the testing work in technical, uh, technical testing work itself. So how do game developing companies test? They do user testing, usability testing, explorative testing, and unit testing. These are the four things they focus on. And out of these four, only the last one, the unit testing and usually automated unit testing, by the way, is only one which is technically oriented. It's used to ensure that everything works. Everything else is about user usability or finding out the stupid errors or the stupid problems. Like for example, that you can accidentally fall off the face of the earth if you walk too far up to the ocean, like you could do in the original World of Warcraft. Actually in the one island, which they failed to add a climbable harbor into the island itself, you actually had to kill yourself by swimming from the, uh, uh, swimming over the end of the map because the game had a certain problems at the first launch feature. Oh, of course, you, the game studio also didn't expect someone to try to jump with the blink from the highest point of the mountain, but that's a separate story, really. But anyway, that's something you catch with explorative testing. That's not something that anyone who is actually sane and following the game wants to try out unless they find out that there's no fall damage if you hit water. So if you can jump far enough, you might be able to jump uh, literally out, <laughs> out from the planet. Also, on the objectives themselves, technically good enough is enough. It's, that's a fairly good approach. If it's fast enough, if it's responsive enough, if it's simple enough, then it's enough. We don't do unnecessary or additional uh, work on the product when we get it to the technical point where it works. Mechanically, we focus on that it's always, there's always something you can count, do to counter some 
activity. So you test the internal logic because it's fairly annoying to play a game where, especially multiplayer, where regardless of whatever you do, your opponent always wins because they have one killer app or one killer move or one killer activity, which will always trump everything you do. There's a very good example of this what is the uh, card dual game uh, on the South Park team, which I uh, unfortunately don't re remember the name anymore. It was developed by a Finnish company and it was uh, Finland was the first places where it was test used. Uh, there was one broken ability uh, if you might get randomly when you create your character. I think it was called Arrow Storm or something like that. And that was mechanically broken. The players who got Arrow Storm always or almost always won the duels, simply because that was way too powerful and killed every other guy the other opponent had put on the field at that stage. So the game was mechanically broken. So why would I want to play a game where I'm getting constantly the crap beaten out of myself because I wasn't lucky enough to get one card at the start of the game? Well, I don't, and that's why you don't even you don't either know the name of the game unless they fix something later. And also, on the user experience, you might want to test, is this what we really want or is this what our customers really want to use? On this, there's an example of the one platformer game where the bug introduced a new way of moving. I, I think I told this on the last lecture. But anyway, it bears a repetition that the bug made the game much more funnier. The test users loved the new way of climbing on the walls, like you would do with a Spider-Man or something like that. So the entire game was uh, revised around that mechanic because the user experience testing found out that that's hugely or majorly more engaging to the test audience than anything we, they had put up so far. So of course they had to design the game around that feature. Now this was at the stage when the game mechanically and technically was already done. They were just testing out their different level layouts what will be left on the final product. And they found out that they have to redo the entire content of the game simply because that was much more better than anything else they had done before that. Okay, so uh, on the tool aspect, on this course we are studying the game engines. Uh, usually we, I recommend that you use Unity, of course, now you are allowed to use whatever tools or more or less you want on your own game. But in, in general, the tools exist mostly to allow easy prototype based approach on development and design. Actually, that's one of the things that most game studios agree on. Uh, it doesn't matter what you are using as long as you can do quick prototyping and test out different ideas. Of course, most companies also use fairly popular frameworks because they simply don't have enough people to do the development work, for example, uh, optimize their physics engine and stuff like that. There's actually, this is something that has changed from the 90s. Before the mobile games became a very, very large part of the industry, most of the games were made completely by the studio themselves or the game engine or the game uh, development environment was made by the game uh, developers and the game studio because there was nothing else. And the, but the, realistically, the amount of self-made tools, is, it doesn't exist anymore. If you need to do animations, you use animation tools. If you, you need to create a physics engine, you use a game engine. You draw the assets and even some assets can be bought as libraries. If you go to a trade fair in Europe, for example, Gamescom, which is a huge, huge thing in Germany every summer, and spend uh, something like 10,000 euros. Oh, it, it sounds like some money, but it's actually not that much, considering that you, are, you can buy with that 10,000 euros, a library of 50 to 60,000 different themed objects. So you don't have to draw any to all the stools and chairs and windows and 
and uh, doors and floors and stuff like that yourself. You just uh, give a commission to a object studio and say that you want to have 50,000 island and Antar um, Atlantis themed objects for my new game, which revolves around, su around submarines and whales. And that they more or less, well, obviously they'll uh, you also use their common objects or stuff like that, but you can buy these things, even objects, even characters, all, all the design. Actually, in some organizations, game studios, the tools extend to the degree that there's only one or two graphical artists in the entire game studio, just uh, making the mine character or the major characters so that they look like they are intended to look and fix the problems or do some small editing work on the existing library. If you have money, you can buy almost everything. But of course, the problem is that if you don't have money, then you have to do everything. So, considering the business logistics, uh, of course, this is a course by Software Engineering Lab, so we are not going to too far into these areas, but it's a good thing to understand how game business works. We start from the 90s or the early 2000s with the traditional way of doing game distribution or game uh, business. The traditional way mentioned here is actually fairly simple. The, de the developer, that's you on this scenario, gets to keep 10% of the revenue. And 90% of the money goes to the publisher who paid for the original work or the distributor who distributed the uh, game console or installation boxes to the stores and the retailer who owns the stores or manages the sales. So they get to keep 90 cents out of every euro you made. So not fairly nice deal, really. It's, uh, it's, uh, this is also why the, the, there were so few developers. If you had a huge hit, then you might make some money and you actually wanted to be the publisher because that's the first organization which actually makes large amounts of money out of all these things. So then we got go to the digital distribution era. So now you could download the game directly to your mobile phone or game console. So things changed a bit. Of course, because there's all, no longer need for the distribution, because it's a digital distribution way, the original approach was that the developer gets to keep 70% of the money and the retailer on this scenario, Google, Apple, App Store owner or Steam or someone else takes 30% cut of also including also all the maintenance work of the infrastructure and network and other stuff. Of course, realistically, you also need to have a marketer who used to be the publisher here who takes 35% cut. So basically the publisher didn't actually go anywhere. They just became a company doing marketing work or publicity work or visibility work for your product. Because you need to have visibility. If you don't have any marketing work done, then no one knows you exist and the game doesn't go anywhere. But of course, free to play approach even changed this approach because there's no money in distributing something that's free but it's, there's money in actually offering extra services or things you can buy when you are playing a free-to-play free, free -to -play game. So, but if we, before going to the free-to-play games, then let's take a look at the pay-to-play stuff here. So, this is actually something that was told to me by one game studio. They made two games, their first game and their second game and the first game was more or less a tech demo for their infrastructure, which really wasn't marketed that much. They were just testing out that everything works and everything goes fluently, did uh, some test runs on how many people they are going, going to get with a small amount of money and that sort of stuff. It was basically what they would later say non-marketed game and it profited them 74 euros total between five people taking four months to make the game. Not really something that you can uh, use to reserve your out-of-orbit flight with the SpaceX or anything like that. 
But if but the second game they made, they actually had a marketing company. They had a sort of publisher with them who arranged all the publicity and who was interested in their product uh, that they only took a cut of the sales. After having it on a couple of uh, on a mobile uh, store for a couple of uh, months, they had already made 25,000 euros out of it. It was a minor hit in Finland, also uh, I guess somewhere like Korea, uh, South Korea, not North Korea, South Korea, and also a couple of other places. But still, the only real difference here was that the other one was marketed. It also mentioned that if you are on the top 25 in any uh, store list, like the App Store used to have, it generates you 5,000 euros per day. It, it's not much, it's actually less than you'd expect. Of course, if you are a huge uh, company, are on the all top list, they'll, uh, like most of the stuff super, Supercell does, it probably makes much, much more money. But if you are on top 25 of your own category, then you get 5,000 euros per day. Uh, considering that if you make mobile games, it takes three to six months to make if you have a team of five-ish people who are very good at their job. And if you are doing pay-to-play numbers, 90% of sales come within the one month of release. So if you do one month of sales, then you have to pay for the next two to five months to make the next product. Of course, there's actually the pay-to-play business model that hasn't died completely. There's a, it's actually fairly popular in the kids' games. Why? Because the parents don't want their small children to play around with the things that might accidentally uh, order something. Or if they give their phone for them to play with, the kids can't get frustrated and spend 100 euros on buying more diamonds or bear, bear assets or whatever you are using in that game to buy for stuff. So actually pay to play model exists. It's not just, it's not the most popular one, but there's still actually business domains where this is, still exists. But if we go to free to play model, everything is completely different. First of all, uh, in free to play models, uh, Marketing is basically purchasing users. How many euros you have to spend to get new, one new user, regardless of the, air, of the place you are spending your marketing in. If for some reason the best way to get new users is to have an uh, adverti uh, advertisement on a uh, local paper, then of course use that one. But most probably the best way would be to buy some social media visibility or something else. So uh, only thing that they are that is interesting in free-to-play approach is that how many euros you have to spend to get one new user who is interested in your product. Because uh, up to 14% of people who download and start your game once actually play it the second time. And out of these people who actually started more than once, 4% of players might buy something once or twice. Give you a couple of euros uh, to get rid of some early uh, showstopper or something like that. And there's the 1% of players, or actually less than 1% of, of players, who are whales. They provide constant stream of income. If they are crazy or interested enough, that might be actually thousands of euros per month. But these 1% of the players are the ones you need to catch. And the 4% of players might who buy something are nice to have. But it's actually a game of attracting the whales, people who will pay obscene amounts of money to play your product. And actually, the money comes from the maintenance stage. You are doing continuous development for the new content. Yeah, that's called live ops, meaning that you are constantly upgrading your game to add more things to do so that these whales don't run out of things to buy. Because it might be a competition like Clash of Clans or something like that, but really if they hit the maximum level and they don't have anything to spend their money on, they will probably do something else. 
because they run out of things to do. It's similarly as if you have a Netflix and if you have watched all the uh, episodes of some TV series, then it will take a while if you, uh, you watch it again or like some people or some people don't ever rewatch stuff they have already done uh, or seen. So similarly here, you do live ops, continuous development, as long as you attract more whales or have enough whales to actually keep your game flowing. If you have uh, this many downloads, the blue ones are the people who download your game, try it once and never come back. The green ones are the ones who keep playing the game but unfortunately, they don't pay for anything. They don't pay for any feature or thing that you could actually throw in your game. And the yellow ones are the people who might buy something once, twice. And the red ones are the whales. And we actually had to have 200 people here because the whales are so rare that we need to have, needed to have much more than 100 users to, act, to be uh, at least close to one marketing study we found and have one whale here. So that red dot there is the person paying your salary. The yellow ones are tipping you for good service. The green ones like you enough to actually bother with your game and the blue ones were interested in enough to try out but didn't like something they saw or found it too der derivative or something like that. And of course, these are only the people who saw the advertisement and actually did something. If you are buying marketing, then you have to also pay for the people who saw the advertisement but didn't click on it or didn't install your game or installed but never bothered to actually start the game. So really, it's a numbers game. Can I get enough people or users, whales, those red dots to pay for all my salary? Oh, well. It also would be nice if it pays for everyone else's salary and maintenance and stuff like that. But this is actually the cruel world of free-to-play model. You pay to get more visibility, to get more people. And actually, uh, from presentation by Rovio, they actually mentioned that they are no because they are no longer the leading company of the area. They are not talking strictly by, about themselves. But these are the five things that you need to design or need to have in your product to be successful. Because this is something that combines all the uh, huge uh, successes of the games industry, especially in the mobile area. If you are making, decided to make PC run strategy games, then it's a completely different thing. But if you are in the mobile game business, if you and want to make money out of games, you should go mobile, you should make free-to-play game, you, sh you have to use enough purchases to actually fund your work. You have to focus on why finding your whales. Who are those people, those red dots who are spending money on your game? And focus your marketing on getting a new people and attracting those whales who will pay you money. And finally, do live ops. So start with a small product, the minimum buyable product, and uh, then start adding stuff so that your existing whales don't swim away and you get, give them more content to fiddle around with as long as the product is something that makes you money. It's really, really non creative mind like it I mean this is some this business presentation is like a spreadsheet but this is actually a cheat sheet to get the idea on how to make your how to get uh, your mobile game startup a successful one and it doesn't even guarantee that it's a success but if you have these five things in your product then it might be something that flies okay so considering that the visibility is the key word here. So the, it was mentioned that the visibility is something that you pay money for. Well, this is because there's also another list of things that Robio mentioned and the other game studios mentioned. 
about when you are having a, your startup company. And this is something that you really have to understand. If you don't have your first product, no one cares about you. No one will try out your new app or idea or game. No one will pay for the app you are making. Nobody wants to invest in your team and no one knows you exist. And this is when you are doing your first product. So everything you will do when you are making your first product or launching your first game is trying to dig yourself out from this hole. So this is the starting point. So this is also why you need to make your portfolio games. Even if the game isn't a huge financial success, it's something that gives people a possibility to see what your team is capable of doing. You can fund your company by selling or loaning your graphical artists, your programmers, your time or talent to some other places. That's actually a completely viable business model. And then design new games or create new games until you find your first hit product so that you can keep doing your own stuff and get your graphical artists and uh, musician and the programmers back from wherever they are loaned to. Also, on visibility, I wanted to add this because this is something that's usually really difficult to explain to an engineer. I'm not underestimating anyone here. I'm just, well, I just want to make a point of it. So this is a product. It's a book about computer science fundamentals using esoteric languages, including BrainFuck as an example. This is an actual book that exists. I wrote it, so I know it exists. Most of the other people don't know it exists because it sold like 300 copies, but it's available online if you buy. Well, unfortunately, it's in Finnish. But anyway, this is a product. And it's a really fairly normal school book. Of course, if I were advertising this, I wouldn't use this approach. I'd probably start putting up these sort of flyers or something like this. Because that's something that catches people's uh, attention. It's not too complicated example. There's not many things to remember. And it's something that uh, steers the people's interest towards actually getting the idea that, hey, I know this from somewhere. What's that? So it's not only about visibility or being in uh, constantly seen. It's also about how you want to market your idea. Of course, I'm not a marketing genius, well, because if I were, I wouldn't be working at a university as a lecturer and a professor. But still, there's marketing courses. And if you want to sell something, you really need to uh, at least talk with the people and not only talk with the people, but also listen to the people who know how to sell stuff. And that's also something that's fairly important to understand if you want to fund uh, or find a game studio. So back to the point. Uh, there's a couple of things that also might uh, be interesting to understand or uh, consider. For example, on the innovation, uh, most games throughout the years are actually, the most selling games are usually just sequels. But actually, uh, that's not entirely true, because of course, there might be money on making sequel after sequel after sequel, because that's something that people know, but also making a franchise out of your product is also or, or franchise out of your IPR intellectual property is actually a fairly important thing here because you are trying to sell a some uh, something that's abstract or something that interests people. There's also the idea that uh, the creative chaos, which the game industry uh, said it's, it thrives on, it tries new ideas. Some people say it's a publicity stunt because developing games, doing game development work, game programming work, animations, fixing all the small things, it's actually a really, really laborious work. But of course, there are uh, creative, as creative aspects in it and creativity in a sense that when you are designing things, you are not very much limited to things that you already know. If you find some new niche or new target area or new theme, especially if you can innovate something 
that hits the next big trend. You are making huge amount of money. And actually, you should look for new trends or changes in trends, because if you are making something that sells today, in six months when your product is out, it's old news. It's already done. It's, your competition has had six months to eat your cake, so to say. So try to go look not for the sequel or like this, but this. Try to look for something new, innovative, creative. And also, uh, you also need to do something new because you want to create new products. You want to create new merchandise, franchise, IPR. And people are always interested in seeing new things. But if you have something strong, uh, Fallout, Far Cry, whatever, then you might, uh, or Assassin's Creed, which actually I think it's now up to 12th installment or something like that. Those, of course, sell because people are just uh, looking to have more fun, stabby time with their avatar. Actually, this was in 2013. It was on the same, from the same set of data as the uh, slide I showed earlier. So this is the market share of different genres in games. Of course, the action games, sports games, shooter games are popular nowadays. Uh, probably um, multiplayer games or duels or whatever, uh, those might have influenced these to quite a large degree. But it doesn't actually matter what the top ones are, or if we have a, a player unknowns, a battleground, or whatever Fortnite stuff we have on the top. But the important part to understand here is that these slides are so there are several slides. There's family entertainment, role playing games, adventure games, racing, casual games, strategy games, fighting games, flight simulators, even arcade games have a 0.2 percent market share here. And in fact, 0.1 percent market share here is 73 million US dollars. So if you can do something like a, an arcade game, which is a niche group, only two people out of 1000 actually play those games or are, are, are even interested in arcade games, it's still 150 million US dollars annually to sell. So basically, if it's good enough, if it's very good, if it's interesting, if it's engaging to your target audience, you will make money out of it. There's no buts and ifs on that. The market is so huge that you don't have to topple Ubisoft or Electronic Arts or these companies to make any money, you can make a family entertainment game and become a billionaire because that 9% market share is huge amount of money. So, uh, like I said, uh, games deliver user experience. If you have your target audience, then you want to know what might interest them or how engaging and interesting they find your design. And actually, this is something that the technical people in the games industry also agree on. The technical viewpoint was that good enough is enough, meaning that you don't spend time on honing the technical presentation when it hits the sweet spot of being good enough, not breaking, not brilliant, but good enough. And actually most people in the game development, even the programmers say that it's a creative work with software engineering stuff in it. So they find themselves to be in the creative uh, industry. They liken themselves more to a movie developers or movie makers in a sense that they are making a product which offers narrative and story and offers you something to do and entertain the audiences instead of people who are just maintaining a service or SaaS portal or whatever other software. So it's a creative industry where you have to do software engineering work. That's at least the most common mindset. If individually 
people might have different opinions, but in general the games industry and people working in it consider them to be first creative and then software engineers. However, games themselves are not art for art's sake. This is usually an argument cited online at the middle of the night by people saying that games are not art. Well, usually they aren't. They are products. They are products designed with a profit in mind. People who make games want to make games so that it makes money. But if it's artistic or creative, that's a really nice thing to have also, because there's nothing against making artsy games, but most people in the games business consider that they are making a product of entertainment. And, it, and art, for art's sake, is a thing that only people who have already made enough money are aiming for. Of course, there's a, for example, example of uh, Journey, the game on PlayStation. It's, of course, it's an art piece. It's, uh, it's very, very good looking game. It has a very good uh, or very impressive artistic vision in it, but still it's a game in a sense that it's a uh, multiplayer experience uh, with another player or alone if you don't have an online uh, online uh, capability on your PlayStation, but still it's sold as a game product. Of course it gives you an artistic uh, experience, but it's oh, it, the game is the first thing that it's designed for. And actually almost everyone in the games industry, if they have to sell it, that if they want to make huge amount of money on their work or have huge amount of merit on their work, they almost always go for the profit. And then say on the second sentence that when I have enough money, then I want to be known for my artistic merit. Well, that's cheating on this sense, but still they are making money out of it. It's not art and it's in art's sake, meaning that it exists because it's a sort of a feeling or artistic thing. And actually, uh, well, even if the design is with profit in mind, there's no real way of doing it. Uh, there's a brainstorming, there's pitching contests, there's prototyping, there's pen and paper. And basically it always boils down to the question, what is fun? Is this game fun? Is this offering the right experience? I'm circling around with this topic, but unfortunately there is no real answer here. So, uh, if we consider a normal startup team, what sort of people start to do stuff? Or what sort of people have a snowball's chance in hell of actually making it to the big leagues? Usually, the normal startup team makes a mobile game for smartphone or tablet. More probably phone nowadays, because tablets are a bit of a dying out fad or have been for a very long time. Uh, there's two to four people. They are owners of the company. They don't have salary within. So they are usually designer, programmer, artist, and someone who actually knows how to sell things. Of course, they do all a bit everything, but you usually have one very good programmer, one very good artist, one very good game designer who's usually also capable of testing the mechanics, and one person who is the manager or person selling your product or trying to negotiate a deal for funding or visibility or whatever. Uh, this, is, uh, this group, if it works, can create a representative game product within three to six months. And it's actually important, like mentioned earlier, there's an emphasis here that if you are a startup team, you, your first priority is to get something published. Because unless you publish something, you are not a game studio, you are a hobbyist group. And if you want to go to the trade fairs or anywhere else, the big players no, are not interested in your organization before you can have a can prove that your team can deliver. If they order something from you, your team will is capable of doing things. And of course, you spend most of your money on marketing tools, licenses, stuff like that. Actually, 
uh, considering that the most important problems in startups, why they fail, what they need, what's the problem they, problems they are facing, the three most important problems are money, money, and money in that order. They are always out of money, and they always would need more visibility. They would always need more marketing. They would always need more testing. They would all may always need more programmers or better or more graphical artists. So in a startup team, usually if everything else were, if everything works correctly, within one year you can start paying yourself a small modest salary. Sometimes it takes several years. And there, there's no forgetting that, for example, the original Obvio team, the Angry Birds, which was one of the first huge hits in the mobile games industry, was their 50th game product they made. Not 15th, 10 and 5, 15th. So uh, 49th game was a flop. The Angry Birds, which they went to sell, was actually originally also a flop because it didn't sell that much. But they accidentally invented the one euro game apps and the advertisement paid games, which made them a huge player later. But that's something that's usually forgotten from the Ovio thing. So uh, getting back, back to the research results. There's a couple of things here mentioned, which are the most important things that matter to game uh, startup companies or game developers in general. The case study companies here are established companies, startups, uh, multinational companies, so on and so on. So based on our analysis, human capital is the, one of the priority things in all organizations. Like mentioned earlier, the only thing that matters is the, that your customer is entertained. So you need to have proficient programmers, excellent graphical artists, sound engineers, sound design, level designers to make that experience happen. So everyone needs human capital or experience. Most of the organizations need marketing. And that one organization where the marketing is not considered important at all, being the white box, meaning that it's the least important aspect of their company, is a game studio which had external publisher. So if they agreed to make something, they just make the game and the publisher in Germany handles everything else. Why would we care about marketing at all? Similarly, uh, financing was one of the things and key partners, well, as in the organizations which didn't find marketing important because, of course, they had someone else doing that. There was also some other things like key resources. This company, uh, case A, I don't remember anymore, but I, I think that they were making an, an activity game for a, some Microsoft thing which was paying a huge amount of their bills. So their key resources were the prototype things they were working on at that time, but that doesn't matter. Anyway, human capital, marketing, financing. And if you can replace marketing, you need key partners or partnerships to do that. So those are the things that game studios need to have so that they can exist and work. And finally, if you are not interested in finding, founding a company, this is actually something collected both from Supercell and Rovio. I was in a meeting a year ago, well, actually two years ago now, uh, in which they summarized what they need or want to have in a people they are looking for. So if you fulfill all this, these things in the list, I don't understand why you are still in this course. You should be already working in the industry. But the Supercell and Rovio combined their learnings and uh, findings from the uh, people who want to go in the games industry. And first of all, the actual talent is rare, meaning that everyone can uh, teach themselves how to draw or how to do programming work. But if you have talent, that's a completely different ball game. If you have a graphical artist who is really talented, they can easily replace 10, 15 other people. But those 10 and 15 other people who aren't talented can never replace that one very talented person. 
So you need, if you have actual talent and if you train your talent, then you are very starting at a very good position. And it doesn't have to be artistic talent. It's a programming talent, testing talent, having finding out what people for, uh, uh, want. These sort, uh, every, any talent, but if you actually have talent, then it's a rare user. So also, uh, if you want to go to the games industry, you also have to have some sort of passion for the industry itself or games themselves. It's a bit of a cliche and a bad cliche, I'd say, at le least to say that you need to have a passion for this game or a passion for this industry. But keep in mind, it's a creative industry. If you have a mindset that you go to the office at 9 a.m. and leave at 5 p.m. and don't care at all about anything, then you probably will not make it in the games industry. It doesn't, I, I'm not saying that you have to be prepared to do unpaid overtime. Well, actually, if you are a developer or programmer, you more or less in all industries are expected to do that. But it means that if you don't care at all about what you are doing, you are just fulfilling tickets and then go home, then it's not probably a good place to be. Also, the large companies don't use game engines. Because the game engine games are not good enough for them. They do optimization work by themselves. They push the envelope, so to say, that they try to advance the technology, at least some degrees. So, of course, large companies like Rovio, they also use game engine. For example, the Bad Big Easy is made with Unity. That's true. But if you want to really get a job there, you, want, you need to learn C++, understand how optimization works, how the uh, algorithmic complexity works, how to avoid certain pitfalls on performance issues, understand mathematics and physics, because you have to do those calculations by hand if you are going hardcore optimization route. And in general, uh, do several different projects, do several themes, do several genres so that you actually understand what differentiates the different products. And finally, there are both companies or all companies have plenty of mediocre talent. Don't be that person applying for a mediocre position with a mediocre talent. Focus on your best skills, what you can do, what you are very good at, and try to make that <coughs> your sales pitch. So, finally, uh, considering that uh, this is something that's geared, that's geared towards more of, uh, advanced startups. So there's also stages on which the organizations grow. Usually the minimal core teams and first priority business startups here are the sort of companies that have been founded on this course and the, the courses uh, which are predecessors to this one. And usually it means that you have, if you have a designer, artist, and developers, then you have at least something. The more advanced companies start to spend their own money on music assets, or business management assets, or QA, or marketing, or domain experts. These are the things that the real full businesses do. And if you want to start your own company or work in a startup, you more or less need to have strategic partnerships to do your marketing work, help you with the business and management aspects, get your graphi uh, first, perhaps second graphical artist as in-source skill, have a musician who understands something about music or make you some elevator music for the levels, stuff like that. But you can't, of course, pay that person, so you need to ha have them outside. And actually, there's also a fairly straightforward path that most uh, startups follow because they, they all have more or less the same restrictions on resources and time, money, human capital, these sort of things. So if you are uh, really looking into this, you should also look into how other companies have been founded and started. Finally, uh, there's a list of research papers. I'm not going to read you these through, but if you are interested in actually studying what 
games industry is and how it differs or how it functions uh, compared to software industry, this university has had a fairly extensive research on software, uh, uh, games as software and entertainment software engineering. So all these bullet points have their own uh, paper or research paper uh, related to them. So if any of these topics interest you, you can contact me or send email or uh, send a message to the course website so we can I, we can talk about these things more or you can google them around and uh, you probably will find them easily so all about design work how uh, game development should be taught how gamification uh, and user interface tailoring can be combined how user motivation can be detected from the activities they do uh, how games industry adapts new technology, uh, how different technical frameworks work, uh, how games are developed or tested, or what are the important elements of companies. All these things that I have mentioned on this lecture actually are based on real research, like any proper university lecture should be. So, of course, if you are interested in continuing with this topic, for example, on your master's thesis work, then just contact me or other of our faculty stuff. So here we go. Uh, today's lecture about games as software is now complete. And like mentioned, if you are interested in these topics, you can also do master's thesis with us. There's going to be a game jam code camps in the near future, so participate to those. And if for nothing else, these topics covered today will be part of this course's exam. So, at this point, the next video, uh, according to schedule, is the industry viewpoint. Of course, this is something that we usually, in a normal year, would have a visiting lecturer from the game studios record separately, or we used to have this before COVID-19. But due to COVID-19, we have been using this uh, one recording from a member of our LUT alumni talking about the early days of his game studio. So this year we will be using the same video. So go check out that next. And on the next actual lecture video, we will be talking about the other aspects of games in software industry, namely Serios games, gamification, gameful design, and the things where things leak backwards. We have been talking about how we can use software skills in game development, but how about if we were to use game skills in software development? So that's it for today. So we'll see you in the next uh, final lecture video. So. Have a nice rest of the day and goodbye. Bye-bye.